GMC Motorhome Program MH4, servicing the motorhome air suspension. Every GMC Motorhome features as standard equipment an air suspension system at the rear wheels. In large part, it's responsible for the smooth, stable ride of the motorhome. A rubber bellows acts as a shock-absorbing cushion of air between control arms attached to each of the tandem rear wheels. This height control valve is used to sense the position of the control arms in relation to the body. It adds to or releases air pressure from the air bellows as required to maintain a constant ride height. There is an identical height control valve on each side of the vehicle, each acting independently of the other. Each wheel has its own shock absorber to control axle rebound and further cushion the ride. Like most hydraulic shocks of this type, they cannot be repaired or rebuilt, but are simply replaced when they become damaged or worn out. An electrically powered air compressor mounted in front of the radiator provides pressurized air for the system. Just below it is a pressure switch. It keeps pressure in the proper range by turning the compressor on and off as required. This tank is a reservoir for the compressed air. It's just behind the front bumper under the batteries on the curb side. A drain cock is on the outboard end. In addition to providing a store of compressed air, the reservoir also serves as a place where the air, heated by compression, can cool and the water vapor in it can condense to a liquid. The drain cock should be opened at least once a month to drain out the accumulated water. The drain cock can also be used to depressurize the system. This must be done whenever it's necessary to break into the system to make repairs. Never disconnect any of the air supply lines without first opening the drain cock to release all air pressure. There is a Schrader valve on the back of the tank. Here you can check pressure with a gauge and if it's ever necessary, pressurize the system with shop air. The tubing that routes air throughout the system is nylon, color coded. The primary lines, those running from the compressor to the reservoir and back to the height control valves, are red. The routing of air lines in the standard system is fairly simple and with the color coding you won't have much trouble in figuring out which line goes where. When the air pressure in the air reservoir drops to 100 psi, the air compressor automatically starts pumping pressurized air to the reservoir through the red nylon air lines. From the air reservoir, the air travels through the red lines to the height control valve at the rear suspension and then into the air bellows through the yellow air lines. Wheels are mounted on triangular control arms instead of axles. One point is the wheel spindle. One point fastens to the air bellows. The third point pivots from a bracket that mounts the whole assembly to the frame. The air bellows serves two functions as an air spring and to maintain a standard ride height in spite of varying vehicle loads. As a spring, the bellows compresses to absorb the movement of the vehicle. When a wheel goes over a bump, it moves upward, pivoting where the control arm attaches to the frame mounting bracket. The upper part pushes against the air bellows. The air bellows tries to push the rear control arm down. When it cannot, the air bellows compresses to absorb the movement. The ride height of the motorhome is adjusted by the height control valve on each side of the vehicle. As the vehicle is loaded, the leveling valves sense the decrease in distance between their mounting point and the control arm. The valve will then actuate and a sufficient amount of air will enter the air bellows to raise the vehicle back to its normal ride height. Since there is a separate valve at each side of the vehicle, the system can sense unequal loading between sides and level the motorhome from side to side as well. When a load is removed, the distance between the leveling valve mounting and the control arm will increase. This time, the height control valve will exhaust air from the air bellows in proportion to the decrease in load. Air is exhausted through the black line from the valve. The optional power level controls 
permit the motor home to be leveled at a campsite where the ground is not level. The system consists of air lines of five different colors, which you see here, and an air compressor, air reservoir, power level valves, and height control valves. With the power level system, a red line still goes directly to each height control valve, and the black exhaust lines are still used. However, the power level system deletes the yellow lines between the height control valve and the bellows. They are not necessary since all air going to the bellows must pass through the power level valves. Here is a schematic of the power level system air lines. Since each side of the system operates the same way, we're going to talk about only the left side with the gray and purple lines. When the power level controls are in the travel position, the power system operates in the same manner as the standard system. On demand, the height control valve supplies air to the bellows. In this case, air travels through the purple line and is connected to the gray line at the power level valves. When the control is in the raise position, the height control valve is bypassed. The power control valve directly connects the red air line to the gray one going to the bellows. In the lower position, the gray line exhausts air from the bellows into the atmosphere at the power level controls. With the control set at hold, all of the air lines are closed off and the system is stabilized. As with any air operated system, in order to work well, it must be absolutely airtight. A small leak is not so serious when the vehicle is being driven, since the air compressor will compensate for it, but it puts a lot of unnecessary wear on the compressor. Air leaks become more serious and annoying to the owner when the vehicle is parked for obvious reasons. Leaks can develop anywhere, but are likeliest to occur at tube connections. Make your leak checks with the system at full operating pressure. Coat the suspected leakage points with a soap and water solution. If a leak is present, bubbles will appear. Leaks can often be stopped by tightening the connection. If this doesn't do it, replace the connection. All parts of the system, including the air bellows, can be checked with a soap and water solution if you suspect they're leaking. If a symptom occurs such as slow pressure buildup in the bellows and air pressure is available, it may be that a tube is clogged or otherwise restricted. Disconnect the suspected tube at both ends and blow through it to be sure the passage is clear. Look too for partial restrictions such as dents or kinks which would call for replacement of the tube. The nylon tubing, besides being durable and weather resistant, is flexible, making it far easier to replace than a copper or steel tube. However, it is not resistant to high temperatures. Never root a nylon tube close to a manifold or exhaust pipe, and never weld close to it. Sparks can penetrate nylon, causing pinhole leaks that could be difficult to track down later on. To replace a nylon tube, first cut a new piece to the required length. Be sure the end fittings are free of any nicks or scratches. Position the nut and sleeve over the tube, then push the tube insert into the tube. Push the tube and insert into the fitting until firmly seated. Seat the sleeve into the fitting, then tighten the nut securely. With fittings on both ends, you can install the line, pressurize the system, and check to see if the new line solves the problem. The air suspension is designed to operate with a reservoir pressure of 100 to 120 PSI. The pressure switch, mounted under the compressor, maintains the pressure range by opening and closing the electrical circuit to the compressor as needed. The contact points, which open and close the circuit, can be seen by removing the switch cover. When reservoir pressure drops below 100 PSI, the points close, completing the circuit to the compressor motor. When pressure reaches 120 PSI, the points open, shutting down the compressor. 
The pressure at which the points open and close can be adjusted by turning the nut on the end of the regulating spring. Tightening the nut will raise both the cut-in and cut-out pressure. Backing it off will lower both pressures. These pressures can be measured with a gauge at the Schrader valve on the reservoir. The compressor should operate when the ignition key is in the accessory position and reservoir pressure drops to 100 PSI. If it doesn't, check these possible causes. A tripped circuit breaker, faulty wiring, low battery, faulty or pitted contacts on the pressure switch, or an open circuit in the electric motor. The circuit breaker is behind the glove box. If it's open, you'll have to check further to find the cause. It will reset itself. If the compressor won't operate or is erratic, it may be that the switch points are pitted or sticking. If so, try a new pressure switch. Remove the switch cover, disconnect the wiring, and unscrew the pressure switch assembly from the fitting. Check the condition of the battery. The compressor runs directly off the battery, and it's possible for it to be discharged to the point where it won't sustain compressor operation. In addition to a faulty pressure switch and a low battery, a bad bearing can also cause erratic operation. If the compressor does operate, but there is little or no pressure buildup, check into the internal parts. See if the flapper valves, valve seats, or piston rings are worn or broken. These parts are all available for service, but if heavy wear is the problem, it may be cheaper in the long run to replace the entire assembly. Keep in mind, too, that the compressor may be slow to build up pressure because it can't breathe. Check the intake filter before disassembling. The filter disc should be cleaned or replaced every six months or 6,000 miles. The filter is removed by removing the filter retainer at the front of the compressor. It can be washed in soap and water and should be fully dried before replacing it in the compressor. You have easy access to the power level valves for soap and water leakage checks and valve replacement. If you're going to disconnect an airline, exhaust the reservoir first. Then turn the control valves to the lower position to bleed all air out of the bellows. The knobs come off by loosening the Allen screw in each one. The control panel comes forward when the four mounting screws are removed. Three airlines go into each valve. If you have to remove more than one of them, be sure to note the color coding so each one gets connected back to the correct port. When reconnecting, wrap the threads with Teflon tape to assure a leak-free connection. With repairs completed, turn both knobs to the travel position. Fill the reservoir at the Schrader valve to bring the suspension back to ride height check for leaks. Now let's take a closer look at the height control valves that automatically maintain a constant ride height regardless of the load inside the motorhome. Here's how. The valve is mounted on the body and linked to the suspension and so senses any relative movement between the two. When weight is added to the motorhome and the body sinks down, the valve arm moves up this allows air to flow through the valve into the bellows and the body rises back up to the normal position. When weight is taken out of the motorhome, the arm moves down, allowing air to escape from the bellows. This black air line is the hose through which air escapes. It's attached to the exhaust valve fitting and is here simply to prevent dirt from getting in the valve. The height control valve responds only to weight added to or removed from the vehicle. It does not respond to quick up and down movements of the suspension as would be encountered on a rough road surface. Clearances are built into the valve which allow a 3 8 inch movement of the arm from the neutral position before any action takes place. Also, the valve is designed so there is a delay in the intake and exhaust valve action. If the valve opened in response to every bump in the road, the air compressor would be working constantly and the height control valves would soon be worn out. 
The ride height should always be within specifications, otherwise problems with various vehicle components could develop. Height is measured from the top of elongated slots on the frame rail to the ground with tires at the proper inflation pressure. The front slot is about two feet back from the center line of the front wheel. The rear one is about four feet behind the tandem axle center line. Consult your GMC motorhome service manual for specific front and rear ride heights. Of course, the ride heights should be the same on both sides. Front height is adjusted by giving more or less twist to the front suspension torsion bars. To adjust the torsion bars, first raise the vehicle with a jack to lift one of the front wheels off the ground. Then turn the adjusting bolt in the appropriate manner. Whenever front ride height is changed, wheel alignment should be checked and adjusted if necessary. Rear ride height can be adjusted at this point. When the nut is loosened, you'll see the valve arm has an elongated slot beneath the nut. This allows the valve arm to move in relation to the valve itself and thus allow ride height to change. To adjust the frame height when the arm position has been changed, disconnect the valve arm from the link arm. Move the valve arm until the correct height is reached, then tighten the adjustment nut and reconnect the valve arm to the link arm. If either of the height control valves does not function properly with the lever correctly adjusted and there are no restrictions or leaks in the airlines, the valve should be overhauled or replaced with a new or rebuilt unit. A repair kit is available containing all the parts usually required for a rebuild and the procedures for doing it are in your motorhome service manual. Before removing the height control valve, support the frame to prevent it from dropping down when air pressure is released. This should be done whenever any repair work is done on the suspension. After exhausting the air from the system by opening the drain cock on the reservoir, disconnect the valve arm from the link arm. Pull the arm downwards and hold it for a few seconds to overcome the delay feature and allow all the air to be released from the bellows. Then, disconnect the two air lines from the valve and tape the ends to keep dirt out. Even a minute particle of dirt can cause a valve to malfunction. With the valve removed, it's possible to check it for leakage by connecting a shop air line to the inlet port and applying about 100 pounds of pressure. Then, submerging the valve in water and watching for air bubbles. Be sure the valve arm is in the neutral position. No air should escape anywhere. Bubbles at the bellows port indicate the air inlet valve is bad and should be replaced. Test again with the air line connected to the bellows port. Bubbles at the inlet port indicate the inlet check valve is defective. If bubbles appear at the exhaust port, the exhaust valve is leaking and should be replaced. Remove the exhaust fitting and the screen. Then remove the exhaust valve. It could also leak around the cover plate, indicating the need for a new gasket. With the airline still connected, move the valve arm to expel any water that may have gotten inside. Do this with the airline connected at both ports. When reinstalling, be sure the airline fittings are clean and undamaged. Do not use sealing compound on the threads. It's unnecessary and only increases the chances of getting foreign matter in the valve. Once it's installed, check for leaks at the fittings and check ride height dimension. To replace an air bellows, again support the vehicle on jack stands. Disconnect the valve arm and move it down to let all the air out of the bellows. Disconnect the air line at the bellows. Remove the lock nuts and star washers on the ends. Remove the bellows and pistons as an assembly. Then remove the pistons from the air bellows. To reassemble, put one of the pistons on the floor and place the bellows over it. Apply shop air to the bellows while pushing down on it. 
When you release the air pressure, the bellows will fold over the piston. Place the second piston on top of the bellows and again apply shop air. Release the air pressure and the bellows will fold into place over the piston. The bellows must be taken off if it ever becomes necessary to remove the control arms. So before reinstalling the bellows, let's look at the steps required to remove the control arm assembly. The shocks need to be disconnected only at the top where they attach to the control arm. The brake lines must be disconnected at the center mounting bracket and at each brake backing plate. The parking brake cable is disconnected at this Y connection. The hub, drum and bearings can be lifted off as a unit when the spindle cotter pin and nut is removed. The backing plates come off with the removal of four bolts. The mounting bracket must be supported on a floor jack when you're ready to remove the bolts that attach it to the frame of the vehicle. There are two bolts holding the bracket to the frame cross member and four holding it to the frame rail. Here you can see the two cross member bolts and the lower two frame rail bolts. This is where the two upper frame rail bolts are. Remove these six bolts and the entire assembly can be lowered away from the vehicle on the floor jack. To separate the control arms from the mounting bracket, remove the Allen head retaining screws on the back side of the bracket. Remove the Zerk fittings and pivot pin nuts. Then press out the control arm pivot pins. Reinstallation of the control arms is a reversal of the procedure we've just seen. Now we're ready to put the bellows back in place. First, raise the control arms to bring them close together at the top and block them in position. Place the air bellows in position and reinstall the star washers and lock nuts that hold the bellows in place. Connect the air line and hold the valve arm up to refill the bellows. With the valve linkage reconnected, you can lower the vehicle to the ground and allow the height control valve to bring it back to the proper ride height. We've pretty much covered the air suspension system except for one item, rear wheel alignment. It's important for good handling and satisfactory tire life. Before checking the alignment, make sure the tires are inflated to 60 PSI and inspect the wheel bearing adjustment. Rear wheel alignment requires that the vehicle be on a level surface while being checked. Full weight must be on the wheels with the vehicle empty. Ideally, there should be zero toe-in or toe-out. Toe-in may be measured from the center of the tire tread or from inside the tires or rims. Measurements at both wheels must be made at the same height. If toe-in is not correct, it must be shimmed. Raise the vehicle off the floor and loosen the six bolts on the mounting bracket. Then insert the shim behind either end of the control arm bracket. After the vehicle is lowered, the alignment should be rechecked. Each wheel should have a slight amount of positive camber. Specifications call for one to one and a half degrees. To change the camber, the shim goes behind the top or bottom of the control arm bracket.